Well, hello. Allow me to take you on a little walk along the road to secure grant-free multiple access for 6G. So what will 6G be? Well, this little road map here, after all, for a walk, we need a road map, right? We need a map. And I won't have time to take you through all the little twists and turns of this journey from 4G to 5G or even towards next generation pathway. Suffice to say that over the years, uh, as seen in this slide, uh, the community has gone through in the first generation of wireless systems from frequency division, multiple access, and then uh, in GSM in the second generation, we had time division, multiple access. In the 3G systems, we had CDMA, code division, multiple access, where we used all the bandwidth all the time, uh, but the users were assigned unique user-specific signatures, almost like a separate language, which was orthogonal to all other languages. And you can slow down the pace uh, yourself and look at the pros and cons of different methods over the years. But uh, one important point to mention, perhaps, is that in the first generation, you had to tune every single transceiver for a specific frequency in FDMA. In TDMA GSM, we had eight channels per carrier. So that made the system more economical in a sense. But again, you know, there's many uh, pros and cons in this context. And uh, I only wanted to give you a bit of a uh, sort of uh, rudimentary insight. Spatial division multiple access came along, and uh, some people talk about SDMA in the context of beamforming, where you create a, a specific beam towards a unique user. Uh, but in reality, it is more like using the unique uh, user specific impulse responses for distinguishing the channels. And then, of course, uh, this method could potentially also combined with uh, other domains uh, like the time and frequency domain. And just to really move along towards the current era, so orthogonal frequency, uh, time frequency space uh, schemes uh, have found favor in recent years and they have, again, their pros and cons. The beauty of this is that in the fourth and fifth generation, the community opted for orthogonal frequency division multiple access. And uh, now the quest is on for the next generation of ideas. And so down here at the bottom, we can see the time domain uh, channel state information estimation, where the blue blocks indicate the guard types. Now, in frequency division, uh, channel state information estimation, we can have a, a bit of a grid where we have the frequency as well as uh, time domain, and uh, we distribute the pilots on this basis. Um, and in OTFS, uh, the uh, benefit is uh, that, again, we can actually rely on an OFDM core, but it has to be extended uh, with a number of other more sophisticated signal processing blocks. Uh, as you see here at the uh, left top left corner where I'm circling with the cursor, this is the, the inverse symplectic fast Fourier transform, and then we need the Heisenberg transform and the Wigner transform. And again, the receiver side uh, adopts an inverse structure. So OTFS is being intensively researched. And uh, the benefit of this is that uh, we convert the time varying fading encountered in the uh, conventional systems like OFDM. Uh, can be converted to a time invariant fading channel in the delayed Doppler domain. By the way, this is all based on the classic Bellow functions, but I don't have the time really to share uh, insights on the Bellow functions in this context. Suffice to say that you find a lot of detail concerning OTFS in this paper at the bottom, for example. So 
Another attractive technique that is worth really discussing briefly is spatial modulation. And uh, really, this goes back to the fairly plausible concept of uh, frequency shift keying that was used in the older days, where we could have, for example, four different frequencies, and we could activate just one out of the four. And this way, we can signal uh, two bits per frequency, and we would just need notch filters to figure out which particular frequency band was activated or, or energized. Now, this scheme, this philosophy has been extended to frequency domain operation as well, uh, which has led to the index modulated OFDM context. So what are the pros and cons in comparison to VBLAST, the famous Bell Labs uh, layered uh, space-time architecture, which would require as many radio frequency chains as many antennas you have. But in spatial modulation, in theory, we just activate, at least in its original incarnation, one out of M um, antennas. And so we would need a single radio frequency chain, although there are, of course, deeper engineering uh, issues to be resolved in this context. And then we could use, instead of, say, the classic FSK principle, we could use the antenna activation pattern to convey extra bits. And we would need only a single radio frequency change, right? And so that's really portrayed here at the bottom. And uh, I can recommend Marco Renzo's uh, well-cited popular paper from the Proceedings of High Tripoli almost a decade ago, right? So where did we get to in the meantime? Uh, well, we can exploit the energy efficiency of spatial modulation, given its uh, single RF uh, nature or philosophy. And uh, so that's, that's beautiful, but it has also disadvantages in comparison to VBLAST because its throughput would be lower. And again, you find a lot more detail in this paper at the bottom about the pros and cons. So can we combine this into a multi-dimensional uh, or multi-domain index modulation concept? And uh, this was really hypothesized in this easy reading magazine paper, almost like a bedtime reading. And so uh, this classification tree here indicates that we could use really index modulation in the time domain, and uh, so we could use the indices of the channel impulse response tabs for conveying information. Or in the spatial domain, we already mentioned the antennas. Or indeed, in the frequency domain, like in index modulated OFDM. Uh, but there are other options, even in the coding domain. So we could use the uh, index of um, even a generator polynomial of a specific code. And then we can combine these into multi-domain uh, index modulation concepts as well. So this is really portrayed at the bottom, and the bottom right corner indicates this, this hybrid index modulated scheme, which really relies on the time frequency and spatial domain. All right. So the famous OMA versus NOMA trade-offs. Uh, let's look at these next for a moment. So power domain multiplexing seems to be the most popular option. However, uh, in the run-up to 5G standardization, there were in fact 17 different NOMA proposals on the table for 3GPP to evaluate. And these were discussed in this uh, easy reading paper at the uh, bottom. And uh, then, of course, uh, there is the uh, NOVA principle, uh, where we could actually use successive interference cancellation in order to detect first the stronger of, for example, two superimposed signals then remodulate it and deduct the remodulated signal from the aggregate or composite signal and end up with the weaker signal uh, becoming uh, the residual, so to say. 
And similar principles could um, apply also uh, to CDMA, for example. Um, and, uh, you know, we could use, uh, for example, uh, sparse code multiple access schemes, which also have found favor in the literature. So a little bit about this, but in the context of a ground-free uh, access method, because after all, if we just use the orthogonal principle, then uh, the number of users we can support is identical to the number of resource slots, whether that's time do domain or frequency domain slots or antenna domain slots, doesn't matter. So the NOVA principle allows us to support more users than the number of resource slots, right? But there are, of course, challenges in this context, um, as well as benefits. So one particular benefit is that as and when a user has uh, some signals to transmit, for example, in the uplink, then they don't have to go through the slow paces of access grant. And so this would be beneficial for short messages, which are delay critical. And uh, of course, there could be collisions at the base station, and we have to deal with this. By the way, this actually again goes back to the good old fashioned Aloha principle, which then was also investigated in the context of uh, you know, packet reservation multiple access in the 1990s. And there was a lot of literature on this subject area. So the challenge is, of course, that we have to now deal with um, identifying which particular user is active that estimate their channels and estimate their data. We can do this consecutively or we can do it jointly, but then it starts to get more complex, of course. And so again, some literature here at the bottom to this effect and some results. I won't really linger on each particular parameter used in these investigations. Suffice to say that there are bit error ratio versus uh, signal-to-noise ratio trade-offs to be had. For example, if we have uh, one or two antennas, you can see that we can gain a good, uh, you know, maybe four or five dBs. In fact, if we uh, increase the number of antennas, and uh, also there would be a potential residual bit error ratio, which can, of course, readily be cleaned up with the aid of um, sophisticated state-of-the-art channel coding schemes. But there are huge different trade-offs in this context. And so I go back to the good old-fashioned 5G concept, first of all, and the spider diagram is really very well known in the literature. Uh, we have the enhanced mobile broadband, we have the uh, massive machine uh, communications, and then the ultra-reliable low latency principle, right? And actually, these are three rather distinct and uh, fairly different um, operation and modes. Uh, but in 6G, these have been further expanded to extreme uh, versions of these schemes. But as you see indicated by these arrows, there are intrinsic trade-offs amongst these different criteria. Like, for example, you know, ultra-low latency really goes against the grain of um, having a high rate. And uh, also, potentially, we have... Uh, the mobility issues, the reliability issues. And so actually it's only Pareto optimization or, or you know, strict, um, rigorous multi-component optimization that is capable of catering for all this, these different uh, operation and modes. So really, I hope that uh, this uh, light-hearted bird's eye perspective on what 6G might become uh, would provide you with, with some interesting insights. And I recommend for further reading perhaps uh, this treatise because it's equally easy reading to the previous ones I mentioned. And it tries to really look into the challenges as to how transceivers and wireless systems can cope with the conflicting 
requirements uh, in different scenarios and how in the face of uncertainty, machine learning can really learn the environment and circumvent the associated trade-offs.